So be involved in every way that you can, because together we're going to win this election and move our country forward. Please join me in welcoming the next Vice President, my friend, Senator Tim Kaine. Hey guys, thank you. Hello Miami. Hello FIU. Y bienvenidos a todos. Bienvenidos a todos en nuestro país, ¿verdad? Porque somos americanos todos. I am um, I'm feeling a lot of things today, most of all gratitude. I, I, I'm grateful to you, Hillary, for the trust that you've placed in me. And we're going to be compañeros de alma in this great lucha ahead. I'm, I'm grateful to the country which has given me so much. I'm grateful to all of you. Floridians, my Virginians, all Americans who poured their hearts into this wonderful, wonderful campaign. And, and today, like every day, I'm especially grateful to my wife, Anne. I love you, honey. I love you, honey. And to my three beautiful kids, Nat, Woody, and Anella. I am the luckiest dad and the luckiest husband in the world. This is, um, this is quite a week for me. And, and believe it or not, for as powerful it is, as it is to become Hillary Clinton's running mate, that's not the only thing on my mind this week. Ann and I have three kids. Our oldest son, Nat, is here today with his fiance. He is a... He's a proud Marine. And, and in, just, in just a few days, he's deploying to Europe to uphold America's commitment to our NATO allies. For me, for me, this drives home the stakes in this election. Nearly two million men and women put their lives on the line for this country as active duty, as reservists, as guard members. They deserve a commander in chief with the experience and the temperament to lead. What, what, is, um, what does Donald Trump say about these great Americans, these two millions? He repeatedly calls the American military, quote, a disaster. And just this week, Donald Trump said that as president, he'd consider turning America's back on our decades-old commitments to our allies. And all of you remember a few months ago when he said about a Senate colleague of, of, of then Senator Clinton's and mine, John McCain, that he wasn't a hero because he had been captured and served as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And he wants to be commander in chief? While our service members are out there on the front lines, Trump saying he'd leave our allies at the mercy of an increasingly aggressive Russia. And folks, that's an open invitation to Vladimir Putin to just roll on in. Even a lot of Republicans say that that's terribly dangerous. When you, listen. All right, I'm hiring for the speech writing team. That, that, um, we, we've seen again and again that when Donald Trump says he has your back, you better watch out. <clears throat> From Atlantic City, to his so-called university, he leaves a trail of broken promises and wrecked lives wherever he goes. We, we can't afford to let him do the same thing to our country 
And folks, we don't have to because Hillary Clinton is the direct opposite of Donald Trump. and insult people, she listens to them. What a novel concept, right? She doesn't trash our allies, she respects them. And she'll always have our backs. That is something I am rock solid sure of. And I know that because Hillary knows that we're stronger together. We're stronger when we work together, when we grow together, when we pull together, when we live in the same neighborhood and worship together and go to school together. When we're together, we're stronger. So, I could not be any more honored to stand by Hillary's side in this very important campaign. We love you both! <laughs> wow. I've, um, I've spent most of my life in public service because I believe in doing everything I can to make a positive difference in people's lives. And I can see a lot of you out there who feel exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. I'm one of, um, I'm one of only 20 people in American history to serve as a mayor, a governor, and a United States senator. So. I have I've been able to see how government works and how sometimes it doesn't from just about every perspective. And I've always believed that however you serve, what matters is whether you actually deliver results for people. And, and that's been my goal. That's been my goal in every position I've ever held. Now, I know for a lot of you, this might be the first time you're hearing me speak. And hey, let, let me be honest, for many of you, this is the first time you've even heard my name. Um, but that's okay, because I'm excited for us to get to know one another. So today, today I thought I might tell you a little bit about me and where I come from. Vice President was never a job I thought about growing up in Kansas. Um, like a, lot of, like a lot of people in Kansas City, my parents weren't that into politics. Church, the Kansas City Royals, you know, that's the kind of thing that we spend time talking about. They, they had too much else going on. My dad ran a union-organized ironworking shop in the stockyards of Kansas City. And my mom, in addition to all the challenges with my two brothers and me, she was my dad's best saleswoman. That ironworking business was tough. It's the kind of job where you can't cut corners. If you're not careful, you can make one mistake and ruin an awful lot of work in an instant. I learned that working in my dad's shop. My two brothers and I, we all pitched in. Sometimes we were scheduled to pitch in, and sometimes dad would just shake us in the morning and say, I got an order to get out, and I really need you guys today. I remember once, the last day of summer vacation, I was so looking forward to sleeping in and then I felt that hand on my shoulder at about six. I really got to have your help to get an order out today. But that's what families do. We would go there early, especially in the summer, to try to get the work done before the day got hot. That's what families do. That's what families do. My parents, Al and Kathy, and they're alive and healthy, and they're happy today, 81 years old, alive, healthy, and happy. They taught me early lessons that have guided my life, the importance of hard work, of faith and kindness, of following your dreams. My mom once told me, and I'll say this, she wasn't much of a lecturer. She just kind of liked to live, and then we were supposed to follow the example. But she once told me this, Tim, you have to decide whether you want to be right or you want to do right. If, if you, if you want to be right, go ahead and be a pessimist. But if you want to do right, be an optimist. And folks, I've been an optimist ever since.
I went to a um, I went to a Jesuit boys' school, Rockhurst High School in Kansas City. And all right, some Jesuits in the house. I like that. I like that. The the motto of my school, this boys' school, was men for others, and that was the that was what we were taught. And that's where my faith, which had been important to me because of my parents' example, really grew into something more vital. It, it became like my North Star, the organizing principle for what I wanted to do. Even as a young man, because of these great teachers I had, and because of my parents' example, I knew that I wanted to do something to devote myself to social justice. And that's why, after racing through the University of Missouri in three years and starting at Harvard Law School, I decided to take a year off from school to volunteer with Jesuit missionaries in Honduras. Hay hondureños aquí. Hay algún hondureños aquí. Okay, un poquito, see? Sí. Well, when I got to Honduras, it turned out that my recently acquired knowledge of constitutional law was pretty useless. Um, but the experience of working in my dad's iron working shop was actually kind of helpful. So I taught teenagers the basics of carpentry and welding and they helped me learn Spanish. And I tell you, my, my time in Honduras changed my la life in so many ways. Ap aprendí, aprendí los valores de mi pueblo, fe, familia y trabajo. Fe, familia y trabajo. Los mismos valores de la comunidad latina aquí en nuestro país, ¿verdad? And here's, here's something that really stuck with me. I got a first-hand look at a system, this was 1980 and 81, a dictatorship, where a few folks at the top had all the power and everybody else got left behind. And it convinced me that we've got to advance opportunity and equality for everybody, no matter where they come from, how much money they have, what they look like, what accent they have, or who they love. In, 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 19, in 1970, a Republican governor of Virginia, Linwood Holton, believed exactly the same thing. He integrated Virginia's public schools after the state had fought for 16 years after Brown v. Board to keep them segregated. Now, in 1970, in Virginia, that took political courage. And then he and his wife went even further. They enrolled their own kids, including their daughter Anne, in integrated schools, and it sent a strong signal to the people of Virginia that their governor wasn't going to back down wasn't going to take half steps or wasn't going to make rules for others that he wouldn't follow for himself. So, many years later, that young girl, Anne, went to Princeton, went to Harvard Law School, guided by her experience as a youngster in the first generation of integrated Virginia schools. And one day in a study group, she met this kind of nerdy guy who had been off teaching kids in Honduras. Um, Ann and I got married 32 years ago at St. Elizabeth's Catholic Church in the Highland Park neighborhood of Richmond, Virginia. That is, that's the parish that we still belong today. Hey, St. E's folks, I hope you're watching. We will be there at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Marrying Ann was and remains the best decision of my life. And it, it, am I right? Am I right? <laughs> and it turns out she actually learned negotiation a lot better than I did in law school, which is how a Kansas City kid ended up in Virginia. So um, Ann and I settled down, we started a family, and we sent our kids we sent our kids to those same public schools that her father had opened up to everybody. <laughs> including, including one school that I helped get built when I was mayor that our school board named the Linwood Holton Elementary School. How, how cool was it 
to see our three kids head out the door with their backpacks on to walk to a neighborhood school named after their civil rights hero grandfather. Now, Lynn, Lynn's example helped inspire me to work as a civil rights lawyer, representing people who had been turned away from housing either because of the color of their skin or because they were an American with a disability. And this was my civil rights work for 17 years. I brought dozens of lawsuits when I was in private practice, battling banks, landlords, real estate firms, insurance companies, and even local governments that had treated people unfairly. In 1998, I won a historic verdict against a national insurance company because they had been redlining minority neighborhoods, treating them unfairly in the issuance of homeowner's insurance. At the time I won that case, it was the biggest jury verdict ever in a civil rights case in American history. I like to fight for right. I like to fight for right. And I found myself going to city council meetings in Richmond to raise the issues that I was dealing with every day on behalf of my clients. But I was frustrated at the division and infighting. So in 1994, I did something that seemed even crazier than what I'm doing now. I, I, I decided to run for local office. Man, I was so scared the day I announced, but I wanted to help my city and my community. I knocked on every door in my district. I won my first race beating an incumbent by 94 votes, the first of many nail biters and squeakers I've had since then. And, and as I've often said, if I'm good at anything in public life, it's good because I started at the local level listening to people, learning about their lives, and trying to find consensus to solve problems. In the, um, in the years that followed, I became mayor of Richmond. I was elected lieutenant governor of Virginia. And in 2006, I became the 70th governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. When, when, we moved, when we moved into the governor's mansion after the inauguration, my wife became the only person who had ever lived there, first as a child and then as an adult. We had, to make, we had to make tough decisions when I was in office because it was the deepest recession since the 1930s. But that didn't stop us from expanding early childhood education, from, from building more classrooms and facilities on our college campuses so more could go to school because we knew that education was the key to everything we wanted to achieve as a state and it's the key to everything we want to achieve as a nation. We, um, we invested in open space preservation and cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay because our kids and grandkids deserve to enjoy the beautiful commonwealth that we love just like you love the beauty of your sunshine state. And, and, and we achieved national recognition for our work in tough times. When I was governor of Virginia, best managed state in America, best state for a child to have a successful life, best state for business, one of the lowest unemployment rates, one of the highest bond ratings, one of the highest family incomes. We did that during tough times. And so, and so today, I am proud to carry that work forward as a Virginia senator serving on the Armed Services, Foreign Relations, and Budget Committees. They actually just added me to the Aging Committee, too. I, I don't know why they would have done that. Why would they have done that? I'm proud to support my wife's public service. She has been a legal aid lawyer, juvenile court judge, foster care reformer. Now she's Secretary of Education for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And, and Ann and I are both so proud of our great Commonwealth and of our great nation. And isn't it great already? I mean, isn't it great already? What a great country. You know, I, um, as I look back over these experiences, what I've learned is that God has created a rich 
and beautiful tapestry in this country. It is a, it is a rainbow of cultural diversity that embraces all people. <laughs> regardless, regardless of their race or economic status, regardless of their religion or their gender, regardless of their sexual orientation or where they're from. We've got this beautiful country that should be a country of welcome, that should be a country of inclusion. And I know that that is a fundamental value that Hillary Clinton shares. You know, Soy Catolico, Soy Catolico, I'm a Catholic, and um, Hillary is a Methodist, but I tell you, her creed is the same as mine. Do all the good you can. Pretty simple, do all the good you can. Measure your life by the positive effect you can have on other people's lives. Be of service to one another. Now that's a notion that Americans of every faith tradition and every moral tradition believe in, and it's a message that Hillary Clinton has taken to heart for her entire life, for her entire life. <laughs> fighting, for, fighting for children and families, like when she was first lady, after she tried in a recalcitrant Congress, blocked her in the big advance that we needed on health care reform, she said, you know what, I'm not stopping. If we can't get it all, can we pass a program to provide health insurance to 8 million more American children? And that's what she did. And that's what she did. That's who she fought for. Fighting for, fighting for equal rights for African Americans, for Latinos, for people with disabilities, for LGBT Americans. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attack, fighting tenaciously to make sure that 9-11 first responders in New York and other, lo and other localities would get health benefits. Now, there are an awful lot of people, an awful lot of people who put their trust and their faith in Hillary, and she's always, and she's always delivered for them from working with the Children's Defense Fund, to First Lady of Arkansas, to First Lady of the United States, to Senator, to Secretary of State, she has always delivered. And, And you know what? Here's something you can tell about a great leader. leader. She not only delivers in the easy times or the simple times, she delivers in the tough times, and she even delivers when she's on the receiving end of one attack after another. She never backs down. She never backs down. Hillary. Hillary, whatever the, whatever the drama, whatever the attack, whatever the situation stays focused on, what matters helping people. That's, that's what keeps her going. So here's how Hillary and I are going to continue that work with a strong, progressive agenda. We're, we're going to make the American economy work for everybody, not just those at the top. Not just those at the top. And we'll do that, we'll do that by making the largest investment in good paying jobs since World War II. We will make college debt free for everybody. We'll rewrite the rules so that companies share their profits with workers rather than ship jobs overseas. And we'll make sure that Wall Street corporations and the wealthy pay their fair share of taxes. And while we're on the subject of taxes, where are Donald Trump's tax returns? Ra ra raise your hand if you think 
those returns would show that he's paid his fair share of taxes. Well, I, I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of hands. We're going to fight for paid family leave, equal pay for women, and raising the minimum wage to a living wage. To keep families together, to keep families together, and to bring them out of the shadows in our administration, in the first 100 days, we'll put forward a comprehensive immigration reform package that includes a path to citizenship. En el Senado hacemos eso hace casi tres años y estamos esperando todavía para la Casa de Representantes a, a, a tener un debate, un voto en el sistema de inmigración reform, ¿verdad? Entonces vamos a trabajar juntos en eso en los primeros 100 días de la administración. I will encourage you, if you haven't done this, go to a naturalization service where people become U.S. citizens. It is, how many, how many of you, raise your hand if you have been a naturalized citizen. If you, yeah, wow. Thanks for choosing us. Thanks for choosing us. If you haven't, if you haven't been to one of those services, it's going to be one of the most powerful things you'll ever see. Often, after the oath is taken, there's an open mic, and people get to just walk up and say, here's why I decided that I wanted to become a citizen of the United States, and it will just bring tears to your eyes and a smile to your face when you hear what these people think about the greatness of the United States of America. And, and, when you, and when you go to one of these naturalization services and you see the people's desire to join this great country, you will, you'll basically have this pretty amazing thought. Cualquier persona que ama tanto a los Estados Unidos merece estar aquí. Anybody who loves America this much deserves to be here, deserves to be here. Now, th there's, w there's one last part of Hillary's plan that means a lot to me personally, that, that, that kind, of, kind of emotional for me, and, and I bet it's emotional for you, how to stem the epidemic of gun violence that kills 33,000 Americans every year. As, as governor, during one of the most horrible shootings in America's history, this issue is very close to my heart, very close to my heart. And I know that many of you here feel exactly the same way after that tragic shooting in Orlando in June. We can do better, folks. We can do better. It, it, was, in, it was in April of 2007 about halfway through my time as governor. I had just arrived in Japan on a trade mission to bring jobs back to Virginia, had checked into the hotel room, had fallen asleep when the knock came at my door and the head of my security detail said, Governor, you gotta turn on the TV, we're gonna get on the phone, there's a horrible shooting underway at Virginia Tech, this wonderful college in Blacksburg, Virginia. And um, as jet lagged as I was and just arrived, I said, take me back to the airport, I'm getting the first plane home, it was 14 hours over, it was 14 hours back, and I walked onto that campus jet-lagged and in the wrong time zone, but I knew that, you know, as a leader, even though I didn't have any magic words to say that would take away the horror of the tragedy, I had to bring comfort in some way to the families of those who had been killed, to the students and professors who had been injured, and also to the first responders who had been there to help them. This, this, April 16, 2007, that was the worst day of my life. It was the worst day of so many people's lives. And for the parents and the loved ones of those kids and professors, that pain never goes away. Precious 17-year-olds, 
a 70 plus year old Lithuanian born Holocaust survivor who was a teacher, who could survive the Holocaust, who could survive the Soviet takeover of his country, but who fell victim to gun violence because he blocked the door and told his students to climb out the window as his body was being riddled with bullets, survive the Holocaust, survive the Soviet takeover of your country, and fall victim in Blacksburg, Virginia to the horror of American gun violence? So when the vast majority of Americans, and even a majority of NRA members, agree that we have to adopt common sense gun safety measures, Hillary and I will not rest. Will not rest. We will not rest. Until, we will not rest. We won't rest. We won't rest until we get universal background checks and closed loopholes that put guns in the hands of criminals, terrorists, and dangerous people who should not have them. It's so easy. The American public wants it. Gun owners want it. The NRA members want it. We will not rest. Now, folks, I know the NRA. They're headquartered in my state, in Virginia. They've campaigned against me in every statewide race that I've ever run, but I've never lost an election. I've never lost an election. I don't mind. I don't mind powerful groups campaigning against me. That just is like an extra cup of coffee to me, folks. It just gets me more excited. <clears throat> I'm, I'm 8-0, and, oh, and I promise you, I'm not about to let that change, especially, especially when Donald Trump stands in the way of progress on every single one of these issues that Hillary has laid out as core to her campaign and many, many more. So now I'm going to wrap this up with three easy questions. We're at a university. I can give you a test, right? I can, I can give a test. These are three questions to ask yourselves. One, do you want a you're fired president or a you're hired president? You, of course, you want a you're hired president. Donald Trump is the you're fired guy. That's what he's known for. And when this whole campaign is done, and everybody's forgotten that the one thing they will remember about Donald Trump is your fire. Bankrupting companies, shipping jobs overseas, stiffing contractors, being against federal minimum wage, being against equal pay for equal work. He's the your fired guy. Hey, we've got a your hired president. A your hired president. Let's do, let's do debt-free college so people can have skills. Let's build bridges and roads and airports and ports so people can have jobs. Let's go for equal pay. Let's raise the minimum wage. Let's bring back the dignity and respect of work. You're hired, President. All right. You're one for one. Question two. Do you want a trash-talking president or a bridge-building president? Of course you do. Donald Trump trash talks folks with disabilities, trash talks, trash talks Mexican Americans and Latinos, whether they're new immigrants or governors or federal judges, trash talks women, trash talks our allies, calls the military a disaster. Oh, you're right. He doesn't trash talk everybody. He likes Vladimir Putin. You're right. Let's, let's get that straight. But this is a bridge builder president. As, as, a, as a member of the Armed Services Committee, built great ties with our military and military families. As a Secretary of State, made history building our relationships around the world and putting central to U.S. foreign policy the treatment of women and children around the world. She's a bridge builder, and that's what we need. And last, all right, all right, all right, Florida International, you're two for two. So here's number three. Do you want a me first president or a kids and families first president? Yeah. Of course. With Donald Trump, it's me first. I'm not showing you my tax returns. 
I'm going to run a university that will take people's money and rip them off. When Donald Trump, Donald Trump was in Britain when they cast the Brexit vote to leave the EU, and as the British pound, their unit of currency was getting pummeled, he said, hey, this could be good news for my golf course. <laughs> Me first. But we've got a, um, but we got a kids and families first president. Who from, who from her earliest days has been, and I'll tell you something, I'm gonna give you a secret about those of us in politics. If you want to try to judge the character of somebody in politics, I'll tell you how to do it. And it's really simple. Look at their life and see if they have a passion in their life that they had long before they got into politics. A passion that's not about themselves. A passion that's about somebody else. And then see if they have held on to that passion through thick or thin, in good times or bad, whether winning elections or losing elections, come hell or high water, look to see if they have a passion that's about somebody else, and look to see whether they've held on to it all the time. And that is character, and that is our kids and families first, Hillary Clinton. All right. When, when, I, when I was a kid growing up, my favorite president was another Kansas City guy, Harry Truman. Great Democratic president. Great Democratic president. And let me tell you something that Harry Truman said that could have been written five minutes ago. He said it in the late 1940s. He's, and, it, and it's so well put. America was not built on fear. America was built on courage, on imagination, and an unbeatable determination to do the job at hand. Let me tell you that one again. That's so good. America was not built on fear. America was not built on fear. It was built on courage, on imagination, and on an unbeatable determination to do the job at hand. Friends, Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is filled with that courage, that imagination, and that unbeatable determination. And that's why we trust her to fight for all Americans. That's why I'm with her. That's why I'm with her. Are you with her? That's why we're with her. That's why we're with her. These are tough times for many in our country, but we're tough people. And that's something else I learned from my folks. Tough times don't last. But tough people do. And they don't come any tougher or any more compassionate than Hillary Clinton. So let's go make history and elect Hillary Clinton the 45th President of the United States.